welcome to Free Speech Zone. I guess this is what episode thirty six. So, uh, ah, time flies when you're having fun. Well, we just had that shooting here in Oregon, and uh, you know, it's first of all, it's remarkable the calls for gun control all went up again, and you know, doesn't anybody ever want to fight the cause of something instead of the symptom? Using guns to go after somebody is a symptom of the problem. That's not the cause of the problem. And if you take away, you know, the current method of releasing tensions that people use, guns, then they'll find something else. Without having any martial arts skills of my own, I could wade through a crowd of people and do mayhem with a, with a, a, a battle sword or, or buoy knife or something like that. And that would be just as dangerous as, as the killings you've heard about. But here's an observation that I had. Every time the killer has a name Mohammed, they talk about it endlessly. And how Islam is an evil, evil thing, an evil curse on the earth. Well, this time the killer's name is Christopher, or Chris, anyway, Christian. Okay, and what what is everybody saying? We're not going to justify the killing by advertising his name. We're not going to give him the satisfaction as if he's around to see it. You know, what hypocrisy, folks. Play it down when it's a, a white Christian guy. Although there's a story about him asking, you know, giving a, a religious question. I, I'm not clear on what that was. And it, I've heard that it was, if you were Christian, he killed you. I don't know if he if, if he's pro Christian or anti Christian. Is he sending you to your reward early, or is he? Uh, I don't know. Who knows? Anyway, enough on that one. Then the, the other stuff in the news, like that, it was just so in your face. Was President Obama talking to Putin? Now, here's the problem: Putin is the one who's rational in these discussions, you know, and. The president has to come back here and paint him as irrational so that we can get behind having the war that we're trying to have. W Obama's job is to try to sell this war. The, the military-industrial complex cannot make any money if we don't have a war. So we've got to make this war happen. After all, the military-industrial complex supplies both sides in most wars. So it doesn't matter. We just have to have a war. And it's really funny knowing that to watch Obama come back and talk about how bad Putin was, you know, the bad points about Putin. So I thought, you know, now that Abby Martin's back on the scene with her uh, Empire show, and she's interviewing Chris Hedges about propaganda and the enemy within, that's just perfect after listening to all the propaganda this weekend or this week. So go ahead and play the cut, and I'll be back in about half an hour. This week I sat down with Chris Hedges, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and best-selling author, who's reported from war zones in Latin America, the Middle East, and beyond. His most recent book is titled Wages of Rebellion, The Moral Imperative of Revolt. Hedges is also the host of the new show on Telesaur English, Days of Revolt, with new episodes airing every Monday night. From someone who's been on the receiving end of bullets from El Salvador to Iraq and covered uprisings from North Africa to Europe, I wanted to talk to him about war, propaganda, and revolt. Chris, Eugene Debs, famous socialist candidate uh, back during World War I, was sentenced to 10 years in prison for his opposition to it. And in fact, the Sedition Act made it illegal for anyone to speak in opposition to the war at that time. What does that say about the myth of democracy from that early on? Well, it says that if you challenge the structures of power, and in particular, particularly military power, you are at best marginalized, if not imprisoned. You know, those kind of few 
radical voices that held fast, Randolph Bourne, Jane Addams, Eugene Debs, were um, excoriated in the press, Emma Goldman eventually deported along with Alexander Berkman and others. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, war, as Randolph Bourne said, is the health of the state. And what you saw in World War I was the rise of the military corporate machine, uh, which made war against these radicals through the Sedition Act, the Espionage Act, and more importantly, uh, the Committee for Public Information or the Creel Commission, which created the system of modern mass propaganda, employing the understanding of crowd psychology pioneered by figures like Le Bon, Trotter, and Sigmund Freud, that people were not moved by fact or reason. They were moved by the very skillful manipulation of emotion. And, uh, and it worked. So you had Hollywood was making films like uh, the Kaiser, the Butcher of Berlin. Uh, the Creel Commission had its own news division. You couldn't, you couldn't even write anti-war editorials. It was against the law. Um, it had speakers bureaus. Uh, and you only had to use the Sedition Act and Espionage on uh, those kind of few figures who held fast to an anti-war stance, of which there were not many. And you read uh, uh, people like Jane Addams, and uh, part of what they are most depressed about is how easily the intellectual class, even the purportedly left intellectual class was seduced into the war effort. And then after the war, the dreaded Hun becomes the dreaded Red, uh, and we enter what Dwight McDonald calls this psychosis of permanent war in the name of anti-communism. You know, war, the fusion of war and, uh, and the war profiteers, the militarists and the war profiteers, which after World War II created a situation of total war. I mean, after World War I, factories reconverted for domestic to produce domestic products. After World War II, they kept producing weapons, even though we had peace, uh, so that we could obliterate every Soviet city 10 times over with nuclear weapons. I mean, it was nuts. Um, but with you know guaranteed cost overruns and guaranteed profits, uh, that fusion of the militarists and the corporatists hijacked the country, uh, disemboweled the country economically, and made war on all of those advances that had come under the New Deal. This, so it had both an economic impact and a political impact. Uh, and the U.S. is undoubtedly the world's biggest, most strongest empire, history's biggest and strongest empire, but it operates in a different way than empires past. How has the notion of empire changed over the last century? America is unique in the sense that it colonized itself. So European countries colonized India, Africa, the Spanish, you know, and the Americas. Uh, we destroyed through acts of genocide uh, our indigenous communities and plundered their resources. So you had, especially with westward expansion, uh, the U.S. cavalry acting on behalf of the mining concerns, the, the railroad companies, the timber merchants. And once westward expansion was complete by the end of the 19th century, you began expansion beyond U.S. borders. That's when you had the Cuban-American War with the seizure of Cuba and the Philippines. Uh, you began to see all sorts of gunboat diplomacy uh, throughout the Caribbean and uh, Latin America, in particular Central America. America expanded its power, uh, certainly through the military force and the threat of military force, uh, but more by cultivating indigenous elites that would do our bidding. So you saw the rise of all sorts of dictatorships, you know, whether it was Mobutu in the Congo, or whether Somoza in Nicaragua, or the Shah in Iran, and of course we overthrew the Shah's father, and then carried out a coup d'etat uh, to replace Mossadegh, the prime minister who was gonna nationalize British oil. Um, and, uh, you know, that form of colonial power uh, protected Western interests. That's why Allende was overthrown in 1973 and Pinochet was put in power to protect the copper industry from being nationalized. Um, and these elites were given tremendous resources. I mean, you saw the same thing in 1954 in Guatemala with Arbenz, who wanted to 
uh, challenge United Fruits huge acquisition of Guatemalan land to give landless peasants, you know, an ability to you know carry out subsistence farming and. Um, and when that happened, they, the CIA raised a kind of black army, a huge propaganda effort run by Edward Bernays, the father of modern public relations, who had come out of the Creole Commission. Um, and of course, you know, Arbenz becomes uh, a communist in the eyes of the press, which they, uh, you know, through the manipulation of, of the press, they are able to justify this. So it's a different kind of... Um, Empire, in the sense that you know, for instance, you know, British troops actually occupied India, though many of those troops were Sikhs, raised from the Sikhs. Um, we we find uh, you know venal elites who will do our bidding, and when uh, people rise up against those elites, then we provide those elites with the resources um, by which they can crush. Uh, any form of, of rebellion. I wanted to talk about El Salvador in particular because mm. you've seen, I mean, you've obviously covered extensively the horrors of Uf, U.S. wars all right. over that region. What did this conflict in particular reveal about the lengths the empire will go to maintain economic hegemony? So it's 1979 and the Sandinistas win in Nicaragua. Um, and this sets off all kinds of alarm bells because the Sandinistas... Uh, unlike Somoza, who was the dictator of Nicaragua, who was overthrown uh, and later assassinated um, in Paraguay, um, were not going to protect U.S. business interests. And uh, they did not want to see this spread throughout the region. And so I covered the war there from 1983 to 1988. Um, and we saw the Reagan administration pump tremendous military, economic, intelligence resources into defeating the rebel group known as the Farabundo Marti National Liberation Front. Um, I mean, when I first got to El Salvador in 1983, the FMLN was winning the war. Um, they created the Reagan administration. They brought in a huge uh, helicopter fleet, 70 Hueys, that they put up in the air, which made it hard for these guerrilla uh, groups to mass in any kind of large military. I mean, in the in 83, I was able to go out with up to seven, 800 rebels at a clip. That didn't happen anymore. Um, they created whole black armies that were recruited from Venezuela, Chile, Honduras, and other places that didn't exist. They were ghost armies, um, roughly, or battalion. They call them Cazador, hunter battalions. They're about 350, very well trained, very well equipped. And we would go up into Morazan and uh, come upon the aftermath of tremendous fire. And yet there was no record of a Salvadoran or an army ever being there. Uh, they brought in uh, all sorts of CIA, mostly ex-Cuban operatives, including Felix Rodriguez, who had been uh, part of the effort to hunt down Che Guevara. Mm -hmm. Indeed, he would show us Che Guevara's wristwatch that he was wearing, taken off Che's body. Um, so uh, there's a kind of classic example of the heavy intrusion of empire uh, to thwart. I mean, half of the population in El Salvador at the time was landless. And most of the land was owned by these uh, coffee barons, roughly 10 families, they called them, the big 10 families. It was, uh, you know, it was worse than serfdom, people living in tremendous poverty and deprivation. And when they tried to organize peacefully in terms of building labor unions, uh, they were literally gunned down in the streets. Uh, I mean, they put machine guns up on the roofs of buildings in the capital. And, and then uh, when people began to resist the death squads, when I got to the country, were killing between 700 and 1,000 people a month. Uh, it was, yeah, it was butchery, which we funded and largely orchestrated. You saw the same thing in Iraq, by the way. When things broke down in Iraq, uh, they took James Steele, who I knew, Colonel, he had been the head of the military group in El Salvador, who had worked with the death squads. They moved him to Iraq, and he organized the Shiite death squads, which carry out a reign of terror uh, to break the Sunni resistance. Uh, and really, if you really want to look at it, create groups like ISIS. Uh, and that's how empire works. And when you're up close, as I was for 20 years, and you see the inner workings of empire, you understand how vicious and ruthless and brutal it is. Um, but it's, 
you know, very hard to penetrate within the heart of empire that reality so that reporters such as myself who would report on these things were under constant attack not only from the State Department and from the government, but from, you know, you know at eventually I was working for the Dallas Morning News and Central America and later for the New York Times, but from our own Washington bureaus that, uh, you know, were being spun a fictitious narrative and we were kind of demonized as, you know, being the, the, the fifth front of the rebel movement and of course 22 reporters were killed in El Salvador, some of them assassinated by the death squads. Um, it was, you know, they, the pressure that Empire will put on those few reporters who attempt to go out and actually report is, is fierce and, and, and can even involve, you know, the loss of life. In reference to the Iraq War in 2003, and a war, war is a force that gives us meaning, you said that, quote, the notion that the press was used in the war is mm. incorrect. The press wanted to be used. Yeah. Isn't that the antithesis of what journalism should be? wanting to be used. Um, yeah, but you know, journalists are careerists like anyone else and uh, they know how to advance within the system. Uh, so let's take, for instance, the first Gulf War, which I covered with had very draconian press restrictions. So you could only be in a pool. I mean, I didn't do it. I, I mm. speak Arabic. I went out in the desert and then Cheney drew up a list of 10 journalists he wanted expelled, of which I was top of the list, but they couldn't find me because I was sleeping. <laughs> I'm just kind of ridiculous. <laughs> You wouldn't think I'd be that hard to find in Saudi Arabia. Um, <laughs> no, the press goes limp in front of the military. I mean, first of all, you know, real war correspondents, you know, people who really know the culture of war and have covered it, I think you're talking a couple dozen. Most of them get sent over from their Washington bureau. And I mean, I would literally watch them dress up in military uniforms in, and go sit in a five-star hotel in Dahran to hear Schwarzkopf and sit in the front row. Um, and they, you know, they uh, weren't anywhere near a war, nor did they want to go near a war. And that's true with every war I covered. Only about 10, 15 percent. Photographers are a little more honest because mm -hmm. they have to get out. Um, they don't really want to cover the war. They're, and, I, and, I, and that's a, you know, covering war is a kind of insanity. I have a kind of even empathy for that. But then you shouldn't be there. Um, and the people who, uh, you know, create these kind of heroic narratives around their soldiers or their leaders and tell the story the way they're rewarded for it. They're rewarded by the institution. They're re rewarded by the military itself. Um, and in the first Gulf War, that whole pool system was not actually administered by the military. It was administered by fellow journalists. I mean, I, I used to call them Judenraten. Um, it's insane. Uh, but it, it, it coupled with the fact that they didn't really want to get anywhere near the fighting, and that's the, to the truth of it. And secondly, that they understood what was good for their career, and, mm. and their career took precedence over the truth. And that's not uncommon, unfortunately. And in 2003, you were booed at Rockford College, and you were shamed off stage. I mean, it's just ironic well, because... Well, no, I wasn't shamed off stage. I, don't know, I was forced off stage. You were forced off stage. <laughs> I was willing to keep going. I, they cut my mic. And then campus security suggested that it was time for me to leave. So yeah. It's just the symbolism of that is so ironic because, of course, the, the woman that you were just speaking of earlier and her opposition yeah, to World War I... And then we go to the New York Times' response to this, right, right, which is just hysterical because they're saying you're damaging the paper's impartiality, right. Right. meanwhile lauding people like Judith right. Miller at the time who just became literal stenographers. I mean, what was your reaction to that? Did you know at that time that it had just become a complete farce, or were you slighted? Well, I knew. I mean, I'd been at the paper for 15 years, so I knew the consequences for a news reporter. Yeah. I mean, a columnist can say, you know, but, but of course columnists are selected by the establishment. Um, I would never be selected as a columnist. You would select Thomas Friedman or you know whoever who will, uh, who, who's not gonna make those kinds of statements. Um, no, I, w I was conscious of the game I was playing and the danger in terms of where I was going, but I had spent seven years in the Middle East. I understood the folly of what we were doing. I felt that as an Arabist, I had a platform and a duty to speak because people I cared about would and finally were killed in Iraq. Um, and, you know, I really, it of course, deep sixed my career, but on the other hand, I really couldn't have lived with myself. Given the consequences of what has been done in Iraq, over a million dead, Iraq is, uh, 
a unified country is never coming back. You know, what is it, four million refugees and displaced? It had one of the most modern infrastructures in the Middle East. It's been destroyed. Um, and and out of these failed states that we created or these you know failed enclaves, we've seen the rise of groups like Al Qaeda in Iraq and and which has you know finally morphed into ISIS. So um, no, I, I was aware of what I was doing, um, but uh, you know I and I nobody likes to lose their job, and but I. I don't think I could have looked back and done anything differently. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially since you were covering already the devastation of the Gulf War, uh, targeting of just crucial infrastructure at that point, and then followed by these harsh sanctions that took the life of yeah. half a million children. I mean, how the hell could anyone support this continued military adventure over there? Well, because so much of it's about natural resources. I mean, in terms of, a, you know, they always justify their intervention based on you know, bringing democracy and fighting barbarism, mm -hmm. while everybody sort of turns their back on the Congo, uh, where atrocities are far worse. So, Cobalt. Yeah. So, um, I, I, it, you know, Empire had written a column where I said, you know, you can't be a socialist unless you're an anti-imperialist and an anti-militarist. Um, because it's really those forces. And, uh, you know, we have to remember that the arms industry is a for-profit industry. Mm -hmm. we, we sell 40% of the world's weapons. Um, uh, we have to break the back of empire, not only for what empire is doing to what Franz Fanon calls the wretched of the earth, but for what it's doing at home. Because as it disembowels the country, the harsh forms of control that empire uses on the outer reaches of empire migrate back to the homeland. So you get wholesale surveillance, militarized police, indiscriminate use of lethal force on our city streets. Uh, we're in Baltimore, where you don't have to go very far to mm -hmm. see that. Um, and uh, a, a, a destruction of our most basic civil liberties. I mean, this, you know, this is the disease of empire. It goes all the way back to Thucydides, who saw that as Athens expanded, it destroyed its own democracy. So as Thucydides wrote, the tyranny that Athens imposed on others, it finally imposed on itself. And we're no exception. And, and that's what's happening. You know, we, we should be cognizant of the suffering of the Palestinians and the Iraqis and the Afghanis and the Yemenis and the Pakistanis. Um, you know, we should be cognizant of the power of the industrial weapons, the missiles, uh, the thousand pound iron fragmentation bombs that we're dropping. We're not. I mean. You know, I think only those of us who've been near the receiving ends of these weapons understand how uh, widespread this lethal force is, the power of these weapons. Um, but, you know, it ultimately has reverberations for us, which are already very, very extensive. I mean, the, the forms of, that empire uses to control subject populations abroad are now visible on you know, within America itself. Yet even the most quote-unquote populist candidate today, Bernie Sanders, uh, widely popular among, uh, you know, people who are so-called radical leftists, um, he has refused to confront the war industry and the crimes of empire and continues to do so. Right. Uh, you've, you've pointed this out time and again. Um, why is this issue the most important thing to confront? Well, because what you had after World War II with the fusion of the so-called defense industry, the war machine, the arms industry, and the corporatists who profit off of war is what John Ralston Saul correctly calls a coup d'etat in slow motion. Um, and you can't challenge one weapon system. It used to be in the 60s, Proxmire and others would challenge this weapon system, and that's over. Uh, we mask how much we spend. Officially, we spend a little more than 53% of discretionary spending on defense. Well, that's just not true. Uh, it doesn't count veterans' affairs. Mm -hmm. It doesn't count our nuclear weapons program. And, you know, it doesn't count all of the black agendas, black budgets that we're not allowed to see. Um, so best estimates are that we're spending $1.6, $1.7 trillion a year. And you can't talk about serious reform when you are uh, diverting such massive amounts of your resources uh, towards, towards, towards the war machine. Uh, Martin, that's what Martin Luther King's 1967 speech at Riverside Church understood, um, that we can't build what Johnson called the great, the new society, the great society, and 
maintain imperial war. Um, uh, so, you know, Bernie has voted for every military appropriations bill there is to continue these wars. He doesn't challenge either the military establishment. Indeed, he's been quite welcoming of defense contractors uh, into the state of Vermont because, you know, provides jobs and, you know, they, they try and divvy up $10 billion per state because they have mm. the ability to do so. Um, but if we don't break the back of the war machine, if we don't break the imperialist project, if we don't terminate the for-profit arms industry, uh, then you know any rhetoric about significant change is smoke in the wind. Yeah, and interestingly enough, that's when Martin Luther King Jr. began to be obsolete in the mainstream media and you know exiled largely when he started talking about militarism. They took away was, his FBI protection, yeah. and and both King and Johnson knew what that meant. Meant because of the number of death threats he received, it meant he was doomed. And you quoted Engels in one of your recent speeches on this point, which said yeah. that it's either barbarism or socialism. Yeah, it's often forward. attributed to Luxembourg. She stole it, but uh, it did come from Engels. Yes, it's. It is really between barbarism or socialism. Either we reconfigure our relationship to each other and to the planet in a radical way, or these forces, uh, which in you know theological terms are forces of death, will extinguish what hope we have for life. It, it's that dire, it's that dramatic, as anyone who reads climate change reports understand. Um, and this is the folly of empire. This is how empires mm -hmm. destroy themselves and always have. I mean, it's how the Roman Empire, you expand militarily beyond your capacity to sustain yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's precisely what we're doing and what we've done. And the consequences of it, uh, politically, economically, socially, culturally, and finally environmentally are catastrophic. We hear about revolution in the U.S. like it's some uh, romanticized thing that it can never happen here, something that only happens in other places. Uh, but you've covered so many uprisings, some successful. What has it taught you about the potential for revolution here? Well, when a political system is seized by a tiny cabal, uh, whatever it is, military oligarchs, and the system seizes up and only serves the interests of that narrow elite, um, then there is always blowback. Uh, that blowback may not be good. I mean, if you go back to the 1930s, that blowback came in the form of fascism. Mm -hmm. uh, in the 1930s in the United States, it came uh, from an enlightened oligarchy led by Roosevelt, and Le Roosevelt writes about it quite openly. That's, that's uh, in, a, in essence, he says to his fellow oligarchs, either you give up some of your money or we really face the specter of revolution. Um, and we had, we still had the old Communist Party. You know, we had uh, movements we severely weakened after World War One, but they were still there. Uh, the Progressive Party and others uh, that um, were able to frighten the oligarchs into creating the New Deal, 15 million jobs, public works, all these kinds of things. Many of which, you know, the parks and the post offices, although they're trying to sell off the post office, as they did in Britain. Um, uh, you know, we still use today. Um, but after World War II, those forces set out to destroy the, you know, Roosevelt used to say my greatest achievement is that I saved capitalism. You just wrote a, a great essay that I encourage everyone to read titled The Real Enemies Within, in which you write, the reality of empire is nearly impossible to see from the heart of empire. There can be no rational debate about empire with many desperate Americans who've ingested this as their creed. The distortion of neoliberalism has left them little else. It's a potent and dangerous force within the body politic and it is growing. You know, of course, those who point out the symptoms of a rotting empire are deemed heretics, traitors, just like they've been since World War I. Uh, what does this long-standing inability to counter this dominant narrative tell us about our society, where it is today, and how we can possibly combat this mythology? Well, it's a symptom of the sickness of the society itself. So as people are pushed, I mean, for instance, I was just not too long ago in the South, and you have one Confederate memorial after another. I was walking through Montgomery with the great civil rights attorney, Brian Stevenson, who spent his life defending death row prisoners, most of whom were poor and black, of course, in Alabama. And he said, all this stuff's been put up in the last 10 years. And I said to Brian, this is exactly what happened in Yugoslavia, that as people reached such a point of despair, they retreated into these mythical stories about themselves. Um, and at that point, you, you, you can't connect because you're not, you're not speaking about a reality that uh, 
is defined by verifiable fact. You're speaking about a myth, and I find the rhetoric against Muslims and even the acts now that are carried out against Muslims extremely frightening. I mean, that kind of rhetoric is incendiary. I saw it in every war I covered. You get people to speak in the language of violence, and then they carry out acts of indiscriminate violence. Um, I think we're entering a very frightening and dangerous moment in American history as the government is increasingly, of course, hostage to corporate power and military power, unable to respond to the citizenry, carrying out acts of austerity, stripping us of our civil liberties. We're the most watched, spied upon, photographed, monitored population in human history, and I covered the Stasi state in East Germany. Um, uh, you will ignite. Um, these proto-fascist forces, um, and it will become sacralized in the Christian religion, uh, and it speaks in the gun culture and the language of violence, and it is a symptom of a dying civilization, uh, because in the end, all this is is magical thinking. It's not real, and I think the only way to save ourselves, which is why I'm a socialist, is to reintegrate these people into the economic system. And in essence, give them hope, give them the possibility of a life. Uh, but in fact, of course, we're doing the opposite. We're uh, pushing them further and further into extremists. And as we do that, that will have very frightening political consequences, and there are no shortage of examples throughout human history to prove that. Thank you so much, Chris Hedges. Thank you. An honor. Okay, well, be sure to watch her show on a regular basis. She's doing some really good interviews lately. And uh, I, I just thought I'd, you know, mention that, well, I'm a socialist too, like Chris Hedges said. The only thing is that at least I think I'm a socialist. I'm really not sure because I just recently, you know, realized again that they, they keep calling Obama a socialist. Now, if Obama's a socialist, then I'm definitely not. Uh, somehow these words, and they've even called Obama a communist. And I, The definitions that I know about, he's a fascist. You know, he works with the corporations to improve their lot in life. And uh, that's the definition of fascism, I thought. I... So, well, silly me, I, all this time he's a socialist. I'll have to figure that one out. Well, if you can figure it out, let me know. In the meantime, the coup d'etat that we had back in 2001, where everything changed. Why do you think everything changed? Because it was a coup d'etat. And by now, Obama has purged all of the loyal generals out. So, what I mean by loyal, I mean loyal to the Constitution, the generals that are loyal to orders are the ones that are still there. They're the ones that are that will fire upon Americans when ordered to. Uh, <clears throat> you know, anyway. So more about the coup d'etat. They, they, people keep saying, well, what about the whistleblowers? How come there aren't whistleblowers? Well, last time we played a James Corbett piece, and this is the second half of it. So let's play this one, 9-11 Whistleblowers by James Corbett. Welcome. This is James Corbett of The Corbett Report with your eye-opener report for BoilingFrogsPost.com. Last week on this program, we explored the tired old cliché that is the last refuge of a skeptic who cannot refute the evidence of systemic criminality in the halls of governmental power or the bowels of the intelligence agencies. But someone would have talked. As often as this argument is trotted out in other areas of discourse, nowhere is it used quite so often as it is when discussing 9-11. In other words, these conspiracy theory, these conspiracies are supposed to be able to pull off these incredible feats, you know, like bringing the two World Trade Center buildings down through intentional, intentionally planted explosive devices, and fly the planes into the building, and time the collapse at just the right floors where the planes hit, and the explosive devices happen to be planted. This is not possible. This is impossible, right? So the you know the desire for that, you know, is is there for sure 
It's much like the moon landing where there were thousands of people involved. Yeah. And, and, and yet no one slipped up that it's a, that it was fake. Right. This is, yeah, the other way, is, way we know about conspiracies is they come out. I mean, people can't keep their mouth shut. Whatever one thinks of the attempt to equate talk of the moon landing with documentable lies and omissions in the 9-11 Commission report, or the logical fallacy implicit in this argumentum ad ignorantium, there is an even more fundamental flaw in this argument. Namely, it assumes that there have in fact been no 9-11 whistleblowers. On the contrary, there have been literally dozens of whistleblowers from within the intelligence agencies, government, and the private business world who have been utterly ignored by the self-proclaimed skeptics and the corporate and foundation-funded media who realize that this is the biggest Achilles heel of the official 9-11 story. Barry Jennings was the Deputy Director of Emergency Services for the New York City Housing Department. On the morning of 9-11, he rushed to the city's Office of Emergency Management in World Trade Center Building 7 with Corporation Counsel Michael Hess. Discovering the office had been abandoned, they attempted to flee the building, but were stuck in the stairwell after a series of explosions. After finally being rescued by first responders, Jennings claimed that they had to step over dead bodies on their way out. Jennings died on August 19, 2008, under extremely suspicious circumstances, just two days before NIST released its final report on Building 7, concluding the collapse resulted from ordinary office fires. J. Michael Springman served 18 months as the head of the visa section at the U.S. consulate in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia in the late 1980s. He attempted to blow the whistle on a visas for terrorist scheme that was being operated by CIA personnel in the consulate, funneling Afghan Mujahideen into the U.S. for training, facilitated by the CIA, on behalf of their asset, Osama bin Laden. After numerous complaints up the chain of command, Springman's contract with the State Department was not renewed. The Jeddah Consulate later went on to issue visas to 15 of the alleged 9-11 hijackers. In August 2001, the Federal Reserve Board of Governors issued a non-routine supervisory letter warning Fed banks to be vigilant in monitoring suspicious activity reports. At the same time, the United States economy was experiencing its largest June to August spike in M1 money supply since 1947, with more than $5 billion being added to the currency in circulation over that period. Piecing this information together at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago two years later, economist Bill Bergman wondered if the sudden infusion of currency might have been an indicator of foreknowledge of the 9-11 attacks. When Bergman wrote to the Board of Governors to ask for clarification as to why they had issued their supervisory letter, he was told that he had committed an egregious breach of protocol in calling the board staff and asking the question. Of all the 9-11 whistleblowers, however, Perhaps the most prominent are among the 9-11 Commission members themselves. Six out of ten of the Commissioners have questioned the Commission and its conclusions personally, namely Kane and Hamilton, Kerry, Romer, Lehman, and Cleland. Commission co-chair Lee Hamilton once famously remarked that the Commission was set up to fail. Commission members considered bringing criminal charges against Pentagon officials who had deliberately lied to them about the military's complete lack of response on that day. One of the Commissioners, Max Cleland, even resigned because the commission had been deliberately compromised by the President of the United States. Bob Kerry, meanwhile, has cryptically remarked that 9-11 was a 30-year conspiracy, but no mainstream reporter has ever followed up with him to clarify this statement. There's a problem. It's a, it's a 30-year-old conspiracy. Yes. No, I'm talking about 9-11. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, you are. You mean yeah. this? Yeah. Anyway, I got it. I got it. You've been watching an excerpt of this week's eye-opener report. To continue watching the report, please log into BoilingFrogsPost.com. Yeah, okay, now you catch that 9-11 was a 30-year-old conspiracy. That's the way things work in this country, just incrementally, just little by little, so slow. It's, it's like, you know, those of you that remember that Star Trek episode where a certain species would move so fast they couldn't be seen, and, you know, it's kind of like that. We're moving so fast that we don't see the incremental stuff go on. They don't see us. Well, I think they see us. Anyway, the point is they're slowly but surely plotting. Now, that plot went back. I, I, I can say that, uh, you know, an unsubstantiated conspiracy rumor, how about that, is that Martha Mitchell, the wife of the... Uh, what was he, Attorney General Mitchell? I think that's what he was back in the Nixon administration. I th 
I'm pretty sure that's what it was. I, I'm off the top of my head, which isn't working all the time. But anyway, uh, she was supposed to have been killed or put away or whatever it was, put in the mental institution because she was threatening to talk about that plot. Well, anyway, that's just a rumor. You, those of you that are interested could see if you could follow up on that. But in the meantime, uh, we've got a really good one. This is Wilkerson talking about the... Uh, the latest GOP debates being driven by war profits. So let's play this one out, and we'll see you next week. Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. On Wednesday night, I, and I, I guess millions of others, at any rate, I watched with rather morbid fascination the Republican Party debate. Um, here's a, a couple of clips. Uh, there, it was mostly, in my mind, basically incomprehensible. Many of the people didn't even finish their sentences or paragraphs. Uh, Carly Fiorina actually spoke in paragraphs, which apparently is enough to make you the star of the evening. So here's a couple of clips from Carly Fiorina and uh, one response from Rand Paul, who actually spoke in full sentences. Um, here they are. Here's my plan. On day one in the Oval Office, I will make two phone calls. The first to my good friend Bibi Netanyahu to reassure him we will stand with the state of Israel. The second to the Supreme Leader to tell him that unless and until he opens every military and every nuclear facility to real anytime, anywhere inspections by our people, not his, we, the United States of America, will make it as difficult as possible to move money around the global financial system. We can do that. We don't need anyone's cooperation to do it. And every ally and every adversary we have in this world will know that the United States of America is back in the leadership business, which is how we must stand with our allies. Having met, met, yeah, Putin, met Vladimir Putin, if I may, yes. having met Vladimir Putin, I wouldn't talk to him at all. We've talked way too much to him. What I would do immediately is begin rebuilding the Sixth Fleet. I would begin rebuilding the missile defense program in Poland. I would conduct regular aggressive military exercises in the Baltic states. I'd probably send a few thousand more troops into Germany. Vladimir Putin would get the message. We have to learn sometimes the interventions backfire. The Iraq war backfired and did not help us. We're still paying the repercussions of a bad decision. We have Better to ball. make the decision now in Syria. Should we topple Assad? Many up here wanted to topple Assad, and it's like I said no because Thank if you, you do, Paul. ISIS Thank will now be in Thank charge. You, Senator Paul. No, go, go go well, as I said, uh, I, it, for most of the night, I found those two people, Fiorina and Rand Paul, the only ones that actually made cogent points. On the other hand, Fiorina's warmongering uh, the, back in the leadership business seemed to be a complete repetition of the kind of stuff we were hearing from Dick Cheney for eight years. And one would think that this kind of foreign policy outlook would have been distasteful and found ineffectual even for the interests of large sections of the American elite, who found who not only was the Iraq war a debacle for American foreign policy, most people by the time President Obama gets elected, called the Bush administration uh, the worst uh, foreign policy defeat in America since World War II. Um, and of course, George Bush had a, uh, his lack of regulation and oversight of finance had a lot to do with helping trigger the uh, 07 08 crash. Uh, but still, these candidates who are espousing more or less the same ideas or even more lunacy than, than even George Bush. They're raising millions and millions of dollars from sections of the elite. Now, I understand there are ordinary people who are not very well educated, who don't know anything about foreign policy, and throwing out we're the toughest and we're number one and this kind of red meat seems to have some kind of, of appeal to. But you would think educated people in the elite, and of course not all of them are educated, but they certainly have access to lots of information. Um, you would think they would have some sense that this is not even in their interests. Um, well, not so. So now joining us to try to make sense of all of this is Larry Wilkerson. Larry was the chief of staff for Colin Powell. He's a regular contributor to the Real News Network. Thanks for joining us, Larry. Good to be here, Paul. So the, you know, with the exception of Rand Paul, who, who uh, you know, who's, uh, comes from a libertarian background and has this sort of non-interventionist position, which is actually in itself not really consistent with the professionals that run the empire's foreign policy. So we can kind of park him over here for a minute. Um, virtually every other candidate on, on that rostrum uh, 
we're miles away from even what um, people that run the empire actually think should be done. Um, back into the Cheney Bush type of uh, sociopathy. Um, and, and this gets financed to, to the tune of tens and tens of millions of dollars. So who's doing this and, and, and what, is, what kind of psyche is behind this? The first thing I'd say is after you play the clips and so forth, um, I, I thought John Kasich also made some cogent comments about the budget, but I agree with you that <clears throat> other than the three we've just cited, um, this was uh, another freak show, as the Financial Times called the first debates, only this one was a little longer and a little worse, maybe. Um, to answer your question directly, I think you have to start looking at the money. Um, I would agree with you 100% that a lot of these people are not as uh, educated, if you will, as their money would indicate. It's not the equivalency that people think it is that brains go along with money. Entrepreneurship, uh, creativity sometimes, good business skills and so forth perhaps, not even that sometimes, but brains do not necessarily go along with money. But there is a group in this country who will put money behind anyone who looks like he's going to maintain and even push more stridently than before uh, the business of war, if you will. Um, I recently had a person uh, at the highest levels of power in this land say to me, inside Washington, there's a bias toward war. That's absolutely correct. Lots of people made a lot of money off the invasion of Iraq. Lots of people made a lot of money off Afghanistan. Lots of people are still making, did and are still making lots of money over this politics of fear associated with terrorism and the counterterrorism associated with it. So this is a very lucrative business war. And I think there was a, I'm coming increasingly to believe with regard to George W. Bush, there was a group around him that thought he was malleable, manipulatable, that were he the president, you could get just about anything you wanted, domestically or internationally. And I think there's a group around these people, too, who feel the same way about most of them, whose intellectual quotient, with the exception of perhaps Kasich in monetary matters, Rand Paul in terms of the use of the war instrument, and maybe one or two others with niches of excellence, these people present that opportunity par excellence. There is no one in this group who is qualified to be president and commander in chief of the United States. Period. I mean, it's somewhat. Uh, I mean, I don't know how how one still gets surprised at this kind of stuff or alarmed. As, as I said, uh, as I said, I was kind of watching with morbid fascination. But if only Donald Trump, other than Rand Paul, but only Donald Trump actually called the Bush administration a disaster and all the others are essentially defending it. I mean, here's a clip of Jeb Bush uh, talking about how his brother kept the country safe. You know what? As it relates to my brother, there's one thing I know for sure. He kept us safe. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> Donald. Now, I understand Jeb Bush finding it necessary and perhaps believes that he has to defend his brother. Or perhaps he, I don't even know how he could think that, that President Bush kept the country safe. But what I was astounded at is how much applause he got. It wasn't that long ago that even in Republican Party circles, by the end of that George Bush administration, they realized, to quote Donald Trump, what a disaster that administration was. Uh, Senator Bob Graham, who was the uh, co-chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, writes a book where he says the number one reason to impeach George Bush is that 9-11 might have been preventable. And he talks about all the various examples of how the Bush administration, at, at the very least, didn't pay attention to intelligence and, and, and perhaps worse. Uh, but the amount of incompetency, again, at the very least, that helped facilitate or not stop 9-11. And if you watch the real news, we think it goes further than that, but we need to go into that now. Uh, but the applause to, in defense of the Bush administration was astounding. Did you find that? Well, you know, I don't look at CNN much different from Fox News. And as a matter of fact, I don't look at any of the corporate media much different from any other aspect of the corporate media. They have their own lines and they're different 
progressive, liberal, conservative, if you will, bents, although I don't even know what those words mean anymore in the ambiguity of the American political scene. But I don't feel that CNN is any better than anyone else. They put, look, look what they do with Trump. They put Trump up there to increase their ratings. And they bait him in order to increase their ratings. They even encourage by their innuendo and questions the other candidates to help them bait Trump and therefore increase their ratings. The only reason Donald Trump has the ratings he has is because of that. And I must say, because of my political party, who, uh, which is composed of a lot of nuts, a lot of crazies, a lot of people who probably shouldn't be casting a vote, as a matter of fact, because they are so lun- they are such lunatics. They're maniacal. Um, so this is this is this is something that we look at as theater. I think if we're going to look at it in reality, comic theater, farce, uh, a freak show, as I said, the Financial Times called it. It's scary when you think that any one of these people might have, because of Hillary Clinton's fading numbers. Um, maybe even win the White House, but they're not any scarier than George W. Bush when you come to think of it. That's pretty scary, though, as you pointed out. But what choice do we have in this country anymore? We're 330 million people strong, and we can't produce any more than those 17 and the people who preceded them in the so-called little debate. We can't produce for one of our major political parties anything better than they've displayed. This is pretty pathetic. The, uh, when you get back to this issue of money and who, the amount of money made out of war, how, how direct the connection do you think there is between the propping up these kind of candidates, between you know, industrial military complex manufacturers, uh, fossil fuel, which I would guess on the whole does pretty well with war or, or almost war, um, and these sections of capital that, that, that do so well out of war, uh, the, the extent of their own uh, short-sightedness is so profound. I, I always go back to the, the issue of tobacco companies, that tobacco companies were not only sitting on research that showed that cigarette smoking caused cancer, but they were, they were encouraging their own kids to smoke, even though they knew that. I mean, it's, 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 there's a, 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 the, the profound blindness of all of this is remarkable, but this is the kind of thing that leads to world wars. And when you look at the history of democracy, Paul, when you look at it closely from Athens through Britain to the United States, you see a suicidal tendency. I mean, not for nothing didn't John Adams say that there never was a democracy yet that didn't commit suicide, or Abraham Lincoln say no Napoleon would cross the Appalachians, no dictator would take America, we would murder ourselves if we were to fall. That's the way democracies go. Special interests will hoist into the capital for their leaders eventually take over the country. And they take over the country adverse to their own interest in the end. Um, the old metaphor the, or the, the, the Aesop fable about the, you know, killing the goose that laid the golden eggs. That's what we're talking about when we talk about democracy. We're talking about it killing itself, committing suicide. I agree with Lincoln that no one's going to take this huge nation from coast to coast, from Canada to Mexico, with an army. We're going to murder ourselves. We're going to kill ourselves. And that display last night of the Republican candidates is as good an indication of that as anything else I've seen. I mean, this is more or less what happened to... uh German monopoly capital. They thought they could use Hitler, and, and they wound up destroying Germany. But Precisely. Precisely. I watched 800-pound gorillas, Paul, Colin Powell, Donald Rumsfeld, Richard Cheney. Um, maybe Condoleezza Rice was a 200-pound gorilla, but nonetheless, she fits this mold, too. They all thought they had someone they could manipulate. They all thought that within their cabinet responsibility or their functional responsibility, they could be president of the United States because they had a person who was president who was so manipulatable. And by God, Cheney did it for six long years. Cheney did it. He was president of the United States. And now you tell me that these people were being these 17, these so-called Republican candidates for president, 
are being supported by money, or at least some of them are. Well, it's clear to me why they're being supported by that money, because that money thinks that they, too, will be manipulatable. And when you look at it from the perspective of George Bush's disasters, both domestic and international, I think well, many of them, as I said, made money off those disasters, so they're not necessarily worried about that. And then there is the aspect, too, of this purblind race to commit suicide and gather all the money you can while you're doing it, but nonetheless to commit suicide, nationally, I mean. The, and that's where we're headed. The Republican establishment uh, obviously wanted Jeb Bush and so on, but given uh, how lousy he's doing, I mean, I, he's one of the people that couldn't make full paragraphs and finish his sentences. Um, Carly Fiorina seems to be emerging as someone who actually can campaign, has a certain appeal. Uh, what do you make of her if the Republican establishment decides that she's the, out of this group of what you call a freak show, she actually is someone who might be able to at least communicate with people. Um, what do you make of her? Well, I see her as a, and I'll make this prediction right now, that she may well be the vice presidential candidate uh, for whoever eventually gets the Republican nomination for president, because she would balance the ticket well and and an attempt to attract uh, women back to the Republican Party, or at least more than the few women they have right now. I don't think that much of her skills, and I think her comments, which you played some of at the beginning of the show about the military, I don't think her skills are such that I would vote for her, though. She sounded like someone in 1985 talking about the U.S. Armed Forces. The last thing we need is just a numerical addition to the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Coast Guard and Marine Corps. What we need is a complete rethink of the strategy we use in the world, the military and the national strategy, of fleshing out of that strategy with the force structure necessary and then the equipment and people for that force structure. I would submit to you that we could get by. She's railing about we aren't spending enough money, as are all the other candidates. We could get by with a trillion dollars less, Paul, over the next 10 years. That's $100 billion a year less for the Defense Department if we just rethought it, restructured it, re-strategized it, and then filled that strategy with the proper instruments. We're not doing that. No one has done that. The greatest disappointment for me was Chuck Hagel, who didn't do that. Ash Carter's not doing that. Bob Gates did not do that, although he tried a little bit. Someone has to come along to do that. And they have to fight people like Carly Fiorina to do it because they're still living in the 1980s. All right, thanks very much.